Hello everyone and welcome to video number three in this final video series from me for sedimentary rocks and fossils. And in this video we're going to be using macro fossils as indicators of the environment. So in particular I should highlight that this is a, a kind of a specific application of a more general field called paleoecology, the study of the ecology um, of ecosystems in the past. For those of you that are doing both this module, 27201, and 22101, Evolution and Paleobiology, a second module that I'm teaching at the moment, um, which has an entire lecture on paleoecology, there is some overlap between this lecture and the one that you're going to get um, for that module. And that's because I'm afraid that the kind of the basics of what I need to convey are the same. Whether we, we're studying paleoecology for the sake of studying paleoecology, or whether we're interested in studying um, macrofossils as indicators of the environment. So just be aware that there are a few overlaps in some of the content here, but I've um, kind of specialized the different um, slides in these two sections to try and be complementary to each other for you. So without further ado, let's get going and let's First ask, why do we need to use fossils as indicators of the environment? Isn't it obvious? And the answer is no. There are many different lithologies, rock types, that you can tell apart um, in terms of their environment de deposition based purely on the, th the um, sedimentary characteristics of that rock. Um, so for example, into, you could use the grain size to um, tell apart uh, elements of the energy of a depositional environment um, between a shale and say a sandstone. But there are also instances where we have rocks that are very, very similar lithologically, but could be deposited in any range of different environments. And in these cases, fossils can be integral to helping us understand these differing uh, depositional environments. So my example here is a series of cross stratified sandstones. Are these fluvial? Are they tidal? Are, are they aeolian? Are they um, deposited in a, um, in a desert, say? If you get a marine bivalve in your um, rock, uh, the fossil of a marine bivalve, you can say that that is not going to be either fluvial, so river based or aeolian. If you get a fresh water organism, it's not going to be aeolian, it's going to be deposited in a desert, and it's not going to be tidal, or in fact deeper out to sea, so it's not going to be marine. So that's really, really useful. Um, in these uh, rocks such as this, you can have radically different depositional environments um, without being able to tell lithologically, but the fossils can tell us that. Another really good example are mudstones. These are notorious in providing little environmental information. So deep marine uh, mudstones don't look that dissimilar to overbank deposits from rivers and from those mudstones we get in deltas. Beyond the, the particulars of the depositional environment, so where it is, whether it's freshwater or marine, etc., fossils can tell us important things about the firmness of the substrate, the rates of sedimentation, as we learned in graphical correlation last week, about paleo latitudes and about paleoclimates. Generally, I would highlight that this is a very, very nuanced area. Uh, there are lots of specifics, and, and kind of creating a general overview of how we do this is quite difficult. Um, because actually it just depends on where you're looking in the world, what period of um, time you're looking at, what sediment you're even looking at. Um, and so it's a matter of further study when you have specific applications that you want to understand. But I wanted to, to highlight this by giving you just one example. And this example of how fossils as indicators of the environment works is going to be based on discriminating environments on plastic shelves. It's quite nuanced even even in this kind of um, this specific example and requires some expertise and if you were doing this in earnest you would need to study the time period you're looking at in some depth i'm using in this instance plastic shelves in in a fairly loose sense to mean the majority of continental shelf environments these are a primary depositional environment for marine sediments as i, I would imagine you're aware from your first year courses and you'll be learning with Rodri. so we're going to put focus on this particular environment, and we won't touch on carbonates. These will be covered later in the course with Stefan Schroeder. 
So with that, we should highlight that first, we can talk about nearshore environments. And I would highlight that these are typically easily identifiable from sedimentology. So these are environments such as this beautiful beach um, that's shown on the left here. So we can use the sedimentary, uh, the nature of sedimentary rocks in these environments to tell us basically where they were deposited, and that's really, really useful. But trace fossils, such as these lovely bird footprints shown on the right, can add important supportive evidence for that. So for example, they can tell us about substrate conditions. Um, if we're looking at the tracks of a bird or a dinosaur or a reptile, um, they can tell us how hard and waterlogged the sediment was. And the same is true of shallow burrows. So that's kind of handy. But as we get deeper through trace and body fossils, we can start say, making um, very important conclusions about the environment of deposition of a rock, which we can't do with the nature of the rock itself. Um, so these are key to, for example, bathymetry, working out the water depth um, where, of a rock when it was deposited. And it's this that I'm going to focus on. I'm going to focus on through the medium of interpretive dance. <laughs> That's not true at all. <laughs> no, no, it's not as exciting as that, I'm afraid. We're going to do this through the medium of biofacies, almost as exciting as interpretive dance. So we can work out changes in environment from shallow to deep water based on the fauna that we find in those rocks, so the animals, the fossils. And this is because the composition of the biota, the composition of that fauna, changes as we encounter different environments. In the fossil record, changes of environment are reflected by changes in the proportion of different fossil groups that we get in any given environment. That makes sense, right? You would expect different animals to be living, say, in shallow um, in environments, shallow water environments around where the fair weather wave base is. They may have to be able to withstand all of that wave action as opposed to um, animals that live below the action of waves where they don't have to be a robust, their specialization. So this allows us to place um, fossils into a number of fairly broadly defined uh, groups called biofacies. And there are six of these which are, can be identified based on lithological, taphonomic, macro invertebrate, and ichnological characteristics. So that means both the macro fossils, so the invertebrates that we've been learning about, and trace fossils, so that's ichnology, uh, can allow us to identify um, water depth. And I'm going to talk about trace fossils in the next video. And I'm going to include an overview of those biofacies on the website below this video. I don't expect you to learn those, but what's really useful about this is that you know that they exist. So if you ever have to, in an area, work out water depth, you can be like, oh yeah, Russell was talking in those awesome, obviously, maybe, videos about biofacies that time. Let's look them up. So these benthic assemblages are associated with different environments such as brackish lagoonal, shore face, shelf, slope, and basin siliciclastic environments. So that's quite a broad scope of different environments that we associate with these biofacies. Uh, so these are called benthic assemblages in this, um, in this particular diagram, and you can see how they are linked to water depth. They're fairly broad in their scope, and we can be a bit more specific um, about water depth and environmental de deposition by then adding on top of this idea of these biofacies, um, the idea of the animal communities that we get at any given time period. So this is adding a time element to it as well. So individual communities at a given time period can allow us to be much more environmentally specific. And that's because paleo communities um, represent very, very precise um, paleo environmental conditions that they, they are precise paleo environmental indicators indeed understanding paleo communities is important for paleo so working working out water depth both locally and globally so for example we may have a very specific uh, community of animals that we associate with say rock pools um, in the present day that would include for example sea anemones today and that the makeup of that community will change as we go backwards through time 
because the animals that live within that community are evolving. So that allows us to be quite specific about the environmental deposition of a rock with, I suppose, three main caveats that we may want to consider when we're thinking about this. First, and this is quite obvious, I think, is that we have to be able to, to determine the environmental range of a paleo community in order to use it as an environmental indicator. If there are a wide range of environments under which a paleo community can live, it's not so useful as an environmental indicator. We need to be aware that these paleo communities change with time, and we need to then reassess environmental assumptions if we're working in different time periods to the ones where we built up the idea of what this paleo community means. So paleo communities change through time. And we have to be aware that preservation or taphonomy can have a role. The things that we're looking at being preserved could alter our interpretation of the environment. Because communities vary through time, we're going to break this down in two ways. We're going to break it down into different parts of the environment during different time periods for this particular example. And you can do this with different um, paleo continents through different time periods with different animal groups. So it's, again, I'm trying to build up this picture of nuance um, that we have when we're doing this kind of work. I wanted to highlight also before I go on that in some periods this is quite difficult to do. We don't really have enough fossils to allow us to do this. And so paleoecology of this form is, I think, a um, relatively understudied discipline but has a significant scope to um, reveal exciting things about past life. So bear that in mind and let's add time to our mix. Paleoecology is all about time. So let's look at communities and thus members of benthic assemblages and let's see how they change throughout um, just a few periods of time in the past. We're not going to be um, going through lots of these, but I just wanted to give you a couple of examples to give you a feel for how we can use these communities through time. In the Cambrian, we often talk about Shelley faunas. Um, so I've got an example of a typical low diversity shallow marine Cambrian community on the left hand side here, along with uh, the genus names of the organisms that make up um, these communities. So our typical Cambrian communities comprise low level suspension feeders, and this includes the non-articulated brachiopods that we've learned about in this course, um, some, some of the early eocrinoids, um, and some of the early mollusks as well. This is partly a taphonomic bias. We know that sites like the Burgess Shale, some examples of fossils in the Burgess, Burgess Shale are shown on the right here, have far higher diversity. And we can also say that these communities are dominated by trilobites. Indeed, in many assemblages, over 90% of the animals were trilobites. So this is typical of our Cambrian uh, communities. And all of that is a limit, little limited in terms of the environmental information that it can give us. So when it comes to the Cambrian in this time period, this assemblage will tell us that we're on a shelf environment. It won't give us much more depth information than that. If we cheekily go on to the Ordovician, however, I like a bit of cheeky Ordovician, the, there was a, a radiation event in the Ordovician and from the rest, from then on to the rest of the Paleozoic, we see an increase in diversity in a number of different groups. We see more brachiopods, we see more bivalves, we see more bryozoa, crinoids, rugose and tabulate corals, mollusks, graptoloids, and a greater diversity of trilobites. Um, and we also see that ecosystems become less trilobite dominated. So that was a lot of fossil names, but as you can see, those are all fossils that we have covered over the course of the last few videos because they are major fossil components of these rocks. And that allows us to start to say some quite nuanced things about the animal communities that were around on the, um, uh, around during the Ordovician. So we can use our five benthic assemblages or biofacies, which have been developed, um, and we can say how they're disposed across the, the um, continental shelves at this time. So in general, brachiopods dominated near shore and shelf edge environments. There were some mollusks that were present too. 
um, and these were major components of our shelly faunas. We start to find corals and then bryozoans as we get to mid-shelf environments. We get trilobites in all of these environments, but we get a higher diversity as we get to increasing water depths. And all of that, as a general picture, didn't change until the Permo-Triassic extinction. If you ever want to be more specific, um, this uh, source here by Brenchley and Harper, a 1988-98 book, actually goes into a lot more depth and allows us to, to for example, uh, identify, based on the macrofossils that we find in the Ordovician and in all of the different Paleozoic time periods, identify which particular benthic assemblage we're looking at and thus to within uh, tens of meters what kind of water depth of deposition that we're looking at. So that's really really handy. So that's how fossils can help us understand Paleozoic um, water depth as um, rocks were deposited. I've then split this into um, basically into the Paleozoic and then everything since because the modern evolutionary marine biota radiated after the end of the Permian extinction. This was an event, as I've mentioned already, in which a large proportion of animal groups died out. And post Permo Triassic, we found, find that um, mobile detritus feeders, epifaunal and infaunal but motile organisms, those that can move, dominate our ecosystems over sessile suspension feeding, um, the kind of benthic communities that we saw in the Paleozoic. So there's this major shift at this boundary between sessile and benthic modes of life. Hence, it's a bit harder to draw hard and fast rules about environmental conditions when it comes to the post-Paleozoic. And indeed, post-Paleozoic, um, there has been quite a, deal, a good deal of research, and this t generally tends to um, come to the conclusion that assemblages are more influenced by the nature of the substrate. They become increasingly um, mollusk dominated through time. We start seeing more gastropods and bivalves um, uh, appearing. So you can see on the example on the left here, a shelly lime mud community from the middle Jurassic. This represents a sheltered shallow marine environment. Um, and many of these are mollusks. And indeed that reflects the fact that mollusks underwent an intense informal radiation event during the Mesozoic, a thing called the Mesozoic Marine Revolution, and they became more dominant at this time. It's been argued, and it was argued in this paper uh, from 1987 that I've um, highlighted here, that this was driven by an arms race. Thicker shells evolved, and the ability to burrow deeper um, also evolved, and this was matched by a variety of improved predatorial skills in both shell crushing and boring predators. Mobile benthic echinoderms are also more prominent, prominent post the Permo-Triassic extinction. And of course we get large vertebrates evolving uh, after this time that also changes the makeup of the fossils that we find in our oceans. We can say as a general uh, point that post Paleozoic we, um, sedimentary rocks we start seeing brachiopod and crino crinoid faunas moving offshore and occupying deeper water and more cryptic environments. That's a general trend that we see. So that was a very quick insight into plastic shelves throughout time, their depositional environments. And we're gonna finish in the last video by looking at how the trace fossils differ between different water depths. So I'll see you there in just a second.